Hello chess fans, this is Rick from Chess to Impress with a video on Stillmate and more specifically Stillmate Blunders by Kasparov and Karpov. This position on the board is from a game by Kasparov, we'll go into that in a minute. And we all know that Stillmate is a draw, but it was not always the case. Let's go into the history of Stillmate for a minute. Yes, Stillmate is a draw, but in Spain in the early 15th century Stillmate was a win for the player administering the stalemate. And in the 16th century, also in Spain, stalemate was seen as an inferior victory and only half of the money was paid for it in a stakes game and most of the games played in those days were for money. In England, between 1600 and 1800, stalemate was a loss for the player administering the stalemate. Imagine that. And in India, there was a variation of chess that considered a move that led to stalemate illegal. The move had to be retracted and replaced by another move. And in medieval France, stalemate meant that the stalemated player was forfeited to make a move. And some grandmasters, some current grandmasters, Nigel Short and Larry Kaufman, think that stalemate should be a win again for the stalemating player, which will see less draws at the top level. Many endgames that are a draw now will be won for the stronger side. But enough about the history of Stillmate, let's look at some Stillmate blunders by Kasparov and Karpov as promised. Garry Kasparov had just successfully defended his world title against Anatoly Karpov in, at the end of 1987. It was a 12-12 outcome, but in those days, if the match was equal, then the world champion kept his title. Then a month later, Kasparov went to the World Blitz Championships in St. John in Canada. And he made the quarterfinals and was playing against the Bulgarian grandmaster Kirill Georgiev. Kasparov was trailing Georgiev in the match and had to win this game. He was white and he played f4 here in a winning bishop endgame. He has an extra pawn but also the white king is much better positioned than the black king. So this is an easily winning endgame for white. But Kasparov was very low on time and there were no increments per move in those days. King c5, there goes the f-pawn, bishop c4, f6. Bishop tries to stop the pawn, but Kasparov plays around his bishop. Simple technique, especially for somebody of the strength of Kasparov. King c6, bishop e6, black cannot afford to swap the bishops. And f7. Now you have to give the bishop for the pawn. Bishop takes. And even though white has the wrong rook pawn, this pawn will promote on a dark square and the bishop is of the light squares. That is not always a draw. In some cases it is a draw. But in this case black, the black king, cannot reach the h8 square. And that makes this position winning for white. Of course both grandmasters knew this. And the only reason Georgiev played on was because of the time pressure. It was a blitz game. King d7, king f6, king d8. Kasparov pushes his pawn. King back. And Kasparov is going to pick up the 8th, 6th pawn. Bishop a2, as far away from the king as possible, so that now white can take that pawn. King e8, and there goes the pawn. King f8. But after king g6, nicely done by Kasparov, the black king has to go back. The black king has no access to this square because of the bishop. So the black king cannot reach the h8 square, which would give him a draw. King e7, and there goes the pawn. If king f8, then there is h7, and the next move will be promotion. So Georgiev decides to go the other way with the king. He decides to run as far away as possible with his king, as Kasparov only had seconds left on the clock. It was not even clear how many seconds he had exactly, as the clocks were analog clocks in those days, 1988, with a flag that falls when the time is up. 8-7, Kasparov's going to make a queen. King as far away from that king queen as possible. Kasparov promotes. King b4. And a check. King a5. Bishop d5. Everything okay so far. King a6, and now there is a mate in two in the position. Queen b4, king a7 only move, 
and queen b7 is checkmate. But back to the game after king a6, Kasparov played queen c5. And there was no reply from his opponent because this game is a stillmate. Indeed a stillmate blunder queen c5. I found this position in an article by Judith Polgar in the magazine New in Chess. And Polgar said it's hard to say what kind of reflex caused this blunder. And Kasparov went on to lose the match against Georgiev. And the 1988 Blitz World Championships was won by the great Misha Tal beating Rafael Vaganyan 4-0 in the final. Let's now look at the other great K, Anatoly Karpov. It was 10 years later, it was the 11th of June 1998 and Anatoly Karpov played a rapid match against Judith Polgar in Budapest in Hungary, Judith Polgar's home city. And this position, in this position Karpov is white, is totally winning against Polgar with black. He is, has extra material, bishop and knight against the rook, and also an extra pawn. Rook c1 was Polgar's last move, and Karpov is in raging time trouble. And even though it was 1998, there were still no increments in this match. It was 30 minutes per player for the whole game. Karpov goes after the d6 pawn. A check, another check. Another check, and now the king hides behind his own pieces. Polga played the king, there goes the d-pawn, and now white's d-pawn will promote. Polgar takes, knight out of the way with check, king g6, and there goes the d-pawn. Rook d1, d7, king h5, and now the knight interposes. Polgar gave her rook, of course she's totally lost and only played on because of the time situation. King takes, king g5, Karpov promotes and Polgar runs away with her king to see if she can win on time. Queen h4 check, king e3, queen g3 check, Polgar played her king to d4 and now Karpov has a mate in 3. He could have played bishop f7, then king e4 is the only move, and the bishop goes to g6, king d4 only move, and checkmate with queen d3. But Karpov did not have time to see that checkmate. After king d4, he played the move queen f3. Incredible stillmate blunders from these two great players. And the next time you blunder in horrible time trouble, then you can be comforted by the fact that the greatest players in the game also blunder in time trouble. I have a few more still made positions for you. This is a game played on the 9th of September 1881. Why is Joseph Henry Blackburn a British chess master? And black is Simon Winaver, a chess master from Poland. A famous variation of the French defense is named after Winaver. Here Blackburn has just taken a pawn on a7 with his queen. White is winning with his passed b pawn, which will march up the board supported by the queen. But Wienerer has one more trick, as we'll see. He played queen d8, queen c5, queen back. Blackburn pushed his b pawn, h5, b6, and h4. That pawn can't go any further. Black is going to set up a stillmate trick. b7, a check from Wienerber, controlling the promotion square, controlling b8. King g1 from Blackburn, f6, now that pawn also cannot go any further. Further building his stillmate fortress. He already has this knight nicely pinned, so that knight can't play. Queen c8. And queen d2, very finely played, as Blackburn mentioned in his commentary to this game. If white queens the pawn, then black can draw with queen c1 check. Very surprising, because if you take that queen, it is still mate. None of black's pieces can play. The king can't go to the back rank because of the queen on b8. And all the other pieces are also blocked or pinned. 
if after queen c1 check you do not take the queen but you play king h2 then there is queen f4 check and again you cannot take the queen because after the queen takes f4 it is still mate again so the only option you have is go back with the king and then black has a perpetual because this queen cannot be taken as Blackburn writes, it is a remarkable position and I very well remember the crowd that gathered round to see if I would fall into Wienerwer's little trap. So back to the game position after Queen d2. b8 Queen is now a blunder. And Blackburn writes, I kept them on tiptoe of expectation by holding my hand above the pawn on b7 for some time as I meant to move it. But with the swing of the arm, I suddenly took the knight instead. That was a loud burst of laughter in which we never, to do him justice, hardly joined. So the last move of the game was bishop takes g6 check instead of promoting, which would, which would have been a big blunder. After king takes g6, then white can promote because there's no stillmate anymore. The king is free to play, has a few squares, and also the f-pawn has now squares to go to. After bishop takes g6 check, we never resigned. Very funny, still made story. And I have two more positions for you. This is a composition by Frederick Ryan, and it was composed in the year 2005. White to play and draw. Well, let's look at the position. White is material up, but the white king is in a mating net. Black threatens checkmate with either queen c7 or queen b8, and there doesn't seem to be anything that white can do against that. Well, there's a way, and it has to do with stalemate. It's very beautiful, let's have a look. Knight e5 check is the only move that draws. If you now go to b5 with your king, then after rook takes b2 check, white is winning. He's picking up black's queen. So after knight e5 check, you have to take the knight. Then, the only move that draws is queen e8 check. Very surprising move. Because a move like, for example, queen takes e5, then there's a mate in two with queen b7 check. King has to step aside and checkmate. So queen e8 check is the only move that draws. And why does it draw? Well, if you go to d6 with your king, then actually white is winning again after queen takes g6 check. So after queen e8 check, you really have to take that queen with your bishop. So white is giving all his pieces away. And here comes rook h6 check, skewering the queen and the king. Bishop d6 interposing, and we're also going to give away that rook on d6. King has to take, and then there is knight takes c4 check with a fork on king and queen. And if you want to win this game, you have to take that knight. And then there is rook takes b6 check, winning the queen. And that rook also disappears. Because if you play king d5, then we have three pieces against the rook. And this is a theoretical draw. So after rook takes b6 check, you have to take the rook. And now black is a winning position. With three pieces against the king, a lone king. But white can play King d8, and it's black to move, we're three pieces up, but all we can do is either stillmate white by playing the bishop away. Any move with the bishop, for example, bishop h5, is stillmate, white has no moves, and otherwise, we, if we make another move, then white will take the bishop, and then we have a theoretical draw with two knights against the king. Quite amazing, this position, that black is three pieces up, but the only way to save his bishop is by playing it away, and that means the white king will be still mated. Frederick Ryan, 2005. The last position I have for you on stillmate is from the great Sam Lloyd, the greatest chess problem composer in history. Let's have a look what he composed here. It is from the starting position, and... The game goes as follows. It's a crazy game. e3 and then a5. The queen goes to h5. Rook a6. And look at this move. Queen takes a5. What is this about? Can that queen not just be taken? Yes, it can. But black doesn't take it. He plays h5. And look at this one. White takes on c7. 
this is total nonsense. Black can just take the queen, but plays the rook. H4, F6, what is going on here? Queen takes D7, check. We're not taking the queen, we're going with the king to F7. White takes another pawn. Queen comes to D3. Total nonsense can just be taken there by the bishop or by the pawn. But white takes on B8 instead. And the queen hurries back to H7. On the ninth move, white takes the bishop. King G6. Now there's a mate in 3 in the position. But that's not what this position is about. On the tenth move, white plays the queen from C8 to E6. And now it's black's move. But after 10 moves, black is still mated and that's what this composition is about. It's still mate after only 10 moves. All the pieces that black has left cannot play are either pinned or surrounded by their own pieces. Wonderful and as it is only a game of 10 moves this is a game you can show to your chess friends I'm sure they'll like it. Hope you enjoyed this video on Stillmate. Stillmate from games and from compositions and a bit of history on the Stillmate rule. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and please subscribe to the Chess to Impress channel. Please leave a comment, I will read them all and I will reply to them all. You also may want to check out Matt's Chess to Progress channel. The link is in the description box. This is Rick for Chess to Impress. Thank you for watching.